sorry because my German is very limited, so I will speak in English. Uh, first of all, th thanks Christian for the introduction. Thanks for organizing this webinar um, and thanks for inviting us. Mm, I will not explain my my, CV, my, my, re, my resume. The important thing is that I, I am the author of the methodology, IEC and PPOA. And this methodology is the result of my, of my work as engineer and part-time professor. I work as engineer um, in diverse uh, areas, for example, uh, real-time systems for air traffic control, avionics, um, scale assistance for nuclear power plants and coal power plants, and cellular form applications. Currently, I am working in medical devices. Um, the, the second part of this webinar um, will be given by Alfonso. Alfonso Garcia is an independent systems engineer and consultant. He's an in, uh, industrial engineer but from the University uh, Universidad Politécnica de, de Madrid, and uh, he's in course certified systems engineer professional. He has more than 13 years of professional experience as systems engineer, and he's involved in different engineering projects, including avionics, automotive, and elevation systems. Currently, Alfonso is working uh, in, in our team, in the IESC and PPOI team, and is our expert in the Cameo tool. The content of the presentation first, I will give for all of you that um, perhaps do, do, do not know the, the methodology, I will explain it briefly, the methodology ISC and PPOA, the conceptual model and the method methodological process. But the main um, the main uh, part of the the webinar is the presentation of how we deal with functional architecture using a, a combination of traditional methods and CML notation, and how we implement this in the Cameo tool with very good results because part of the functional flows are obtained semi-automatically. We will finish in the second part. And Alfonso, we will explain the, the example of an electronic parking brake system developed with this methodology, IC and PPOA, and the Cameo tool. I will explain the foundations and dimensions of the methodology. First, I think all of you understand what is a model-based systems engineering methodology. You have the definition of Jeff Stefan. In this definition of Jeff Stefan for INCOSI, a methodology is uh, the combination of a processes or some processes, some steps, some methods or best practices, and a tool. Unfortunately, some companies are focused only on the tool, and they think that having a tool and using CML, CML notation, they resolve the problem. I think that the problem really is teach to the engineers how to think. And this more important, so it's more important to have good processes and good best practices or methods. So, a methodology, EISC and PPOI, is a methodology that evolves for an architectural framework. The architectural framework for real-time systems was called PPOA, Pipelines of Processes in Object-Oriented Architectures. This is a framework for real-time systems that also we develop a tool. We develop a tool using UML notation. We extended this framework for software architecture to integrate systems engineering, to integrate model-based systems engineering. So we develop the methodology IESC and PPOA. This methodology currently is tool agnostic. So you can use whatever tool supports CSML, basically. Okay? We Really, we are using uh, four different tools. And currently, we are using Cameo. 
ESPP is a, this methodology is a requirements driven. So requirements are very important to drive, to drive the architecture and the architecture is very important to drive the requirements flow down. So a methodology, as I understand, is a way of thinking consistently and is not a problem or an obstacle for creativity. Sometimes I have the problem with some customers or students or cost professional customers that they think that the methodology is an obstacle for creativity. It's not the case. In this methodology, you have several milestones when do you have to make decisions that your creativity is very important. This methodology has three dimensions. The first dimension is what we call the mission dimension. In the mission dimension, we look at the system from out in, from outside. The system is a black box. The system interacts with actors. These interactions are described, described by an artifact that is called the scenarios. From the scenarios, we obtain user needs, operational needs that are requirements, but specified from the point of view of the user, not from the point of view of the system. These needs are um, aggregate as capabilities. Capabilities are the ability to perform something. This is the first dimension. The second dimension is the system dimension. In this dimension, we look at the system as a glass box. So we look inside the system. We identify system requirements and we identify the thing, the artifact that we will um, today talk more deeply about. This functional architecture. We identify the main functionalities and also we identify the functional flows, the behavior. It's important because other methodologies don't put many too much attention to identify the functionality. They think that, that they are object oriented. I think is functionality is very important, it's very critical. I will explain it later. After we develop the physical architecture using typically CSML block, block definition diagrams and CML internal block diagrams. And the third dimension is the software dimension for software intensive system or software intensive subsystems. In this, in this dimension, the artifacts are the domain model that is the bridge between the physical architecture and the software architecture. The domain model is a domain model representing the main classes to be implemented by software using a UML class diagram. It's very important. I remember I working for a large space company, very important in the world, developing the, the domain model of aircraft trajectories for a tool they are developing for simulation aircraft trajectories. From the domain model, we obtain the main software components and we represent them with an instructional view using UML uh, class diagrams. And we represent the behavioral view of these software components using mainly US UML activity diagrams. Here also for the behavior in the system dimension, we use activity diagrams. So activity diagrams are using from behavior description at the system level and at the software level. As I mentioned before, this methodology is requirements driven. What do we mean by that? We mean by that, that requirements drive the architecture. What, how they drive the architecture? We have the system requirements, and from the system requirements, we, uh, we perform functional analysis. Performing functional analysis, we identify the main functionalities to meet these system requirements. These main functionalities are allocated to subsystems in this first level. And we use the non-functional requirements and constraints to drive how these subsystems interconnect between them. So functional requirements are allocated to subsystems and non-functional requirements are implemented. From these subsystems, we have also 
a specification of the subsistence requirements, and we go to the next level. Going to the next level, we apply again the functional analysis. So we go down in the functional hierarchy. We have more levels in the functional hierarchy. So we have to allocate new functionalities, new functionalities of lower levels. Allocating these new functionalities, we identify the blocks of each subsystem. These blocks are interconnected by connectors. These connectors, in some cases, are identified using non-functional requirements. When we have the subsystems architecture, when we have these parts, these blocks and the parts, we can go to the next level. That is the component design. Each component, in the, if, if the component is implemented as mechanical component, the mechanical engineers will design this component. If the component is implemented as an electronic component, the electronic engineers will Im implement, will design this component. And if, if the component is implemented as software component, the software engineers will implement, will design and implement this component. But this is very important because the requirement, requirements flow down is um, driven by the architecture. That's very important because requirement flow down is one of the most difficult activities for engineers. We use in this methodology three main uh, best practices. The use of hierarchies, the use of flows, and the use of bridges. We use hierarchies or trees for functional architecture, quality attributes, physical architecture, and requirement diagrams. So very important, these hierarchies. We use flows for represent behavior. These flows are represented by SysML activity diagram. And we use bridge to cross over some semantic gaps. There are two main semantic gaps. The first semantic gaps is the semantic gap between non-functional requirements and physical architecture. This semantic gap is bridged by a bridge that is called heuristics. We apply heuristics to bridge that. This is the, um, I will talk about the use of heuristics in this methodology in the INCOSI um, 2021 conference on July. Oh, today I have no time to talk, to talk about that. And the domain model is the bridge between the physical architecture and the software architecture. The domain model is a representation in UML class diagram of the main concepts that you are interested in implement by software. So, as I mentioned before, we use hierarchies for physical hierarchies. Functional hierarchies is the most difficult for in engineers to build. And I recommend here mentoring and training. It's my experience with professionals and also students that this, this is, is the most difficult. I, I remember an uh, experience with the air traffic control system of UK. I, I, mm, I was consultant, external consultant of the company developing the flight plan processing of the air traffic control system. And one of the main problems was to have a good functional hierarchy. Another hierarchy important is the quality attributes. When you have quality attributes, for example, safety, maintainability, reliability, resilience, etc., and you have the non-functional requirements that are dependent of each quality attribute. I will explain briefly the conceptual model or the ontology that supports this methodology. I developed this methodology for understanding the terms that are used in the methodological process. Well, the main term here is the system, our system of interest, where our system of interest interacts with an environment. This interaction 
is described by association class in UML that is called operational context. So the interaction between the system and the environment is described by operational class by a association class that is named operational context in the, method in the methodology. This operational context is an aggregation of scenarios or use cases. From the scenarios, we obtain operational or needs. Needs are requirements, but specified from the point of view of the actor, not from the point of view of the system. Needs, so the subject of the need is the actor. For example, in a medical device, the surgeon needs to know the temperature of the patient. Okay? Not the system shall monitor the temperature of the patient. It's this, this is a system requirement. The other is operational need. Operational needs are transformed, some group of operational needs are transformed into capabilities. Capabilities are for, of the systems. What is a capability? A capability is an ability to perform something. The system has capabilities. Capabilities are complex. For example, in a unmanned aircraft vehicle, Capabilities long endurance. Long endurance is a complex capability that is an aggregation of properties. For example, quality attributes. For, have, for having long endurance, you need to have high reliability. For having long endurance, you need to have a, a, a wide span, a long wide, wide span, a property, a physical property of the wing of the aircraft. And to have uh, long endurance is recommended to have some functionalities regarding health monitoring. So, a capability is a complex property, a complex uh, combination of properties that, that can be quality attributes, states, physical properties, or functionalities. An important issue in this methodology is that we differentiate that normally, the, the majority of the properties are allocated to system parts. But some quality attributes specified by non-functional requirements, can it's not possible to allocate it. You have to implement the, this, a different word, allocate for implement. Some non-functional requirements, for example, safety, are implemented using heuristics. This is very important issue in this methodology and is an important feature of this methodology that makes it different from other methodologies. I am not in right now, uh, to, to, um, I have no time to compare with other methodologies, but I have studied the majority of them. This slide summarizes what I mentioned before. So I will Skype. We have a methodological process. I today, only we will apply this part of the methodological process. But the methodological process is more complex. First, this is the part related with the mission dimension, where we identify the scenarios, and we identify the top level requirements. In the case of an aircraft, it are the top level aircraft requirements. And we specify the quality model, the quality model and the main quality attribute. From this mission dimension, we go to the system dimension. The first part of the system dimension is to build the functional architecture. And the functional architecture is built with these steps. You can apply it iteratively. When we finish the functional architecture, we build what we call the modular architecture. The modular architecture is the allocation of functions to modules. Modules are logical components integrate, uh, allocating functions that are highly cohesive. When we have the modular architecture, we refine it using the heuristics to apply to meet the non-functional requirements. So this is very, and it's all as well, an iterative process. When we think we finish the functional allocation, when we identify all the functions. We identify all the functions of a system when we have for all the outputs that we identify in the system, a function that produces each output. 
This is the, the main criteria I use. So it's very important to identify the outputs. And the outputs are what the functions produce. So the functional requirements are the re specifying the output of each function. It's very important to, to understand that. It's difficult, but if you understand that, your functional architecture and your functional requirements will be very improved. <laughs> so we produce these artifacts. The functional hierarchies, this is very simple. We produce functional interfaces, and here we use the n square chart that is a traditional systems engineering artifact the important thing is that we implement it in cameo alfonso will talk about uh, this later so here we have the functions in the diagonal and the items in the cells the convention i apply here is input in columns so item one is an input of function one Item two is an input of function two. Item three is an input of function three. In, be, above the diagonal are the e items that, for example, function one sends to function two. Below the diagonal are the feedbacks. With this information, this information is extremely useful for building the functional flows. Alfonso will illustrate it with the, in, in the electronic parking brake and using Cameo. If you have this, both of these, is very, you obtain this semi-automatically, not no, automatically, semi-automatically, because the engineers still need. The second group of artifacts is the physical architecture. We, we have subsystems, we have internal block diagrams for each subsystem, and we have functional allocated functional flows. When we have the function allocated, like here we are using in CSML allocation by usage, function F2 is allocated to part B, to part B here, okay? And we have also this uh, um, merge, decisions, merge, decisions, whatever. A parallel, join, forks, forks, join, etc. Et 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 why we defend here that the functional architecture is very important because as engineers we work with functions the systems has functions the systems has functionality the problem is that the concept of function is um ambiguous concept and um, nobody understands the same um, definition of function for us uh, as engineers a function is a transformation a transformation of matter energy or data to matter, energy, or data. So when we identify a function, we identify a transformation, where it's very important the inputs and the outputs. The function architecture is a representation of the problem space. It's independent of the technology. So it's very important because if the product evolves with technology, the functionality does, does not involve in the same way. An aircraft, have the same functionality all over the years, more or less. And, and automotive, in some cases, yes, have the same functionality. So it's very important to have the functional architecture as an asset of the organization. In the case of Incose, Incosi develops the functional architecture of an aircraft, and it's very useful. I use I use it. Incosi has as one of his main uh, assets. Um, the functional architecture of a commercial aircraft. Some object-oriented MMBSC methodologies approach promote identify first the, the the physical architecture and after the functionality. I I disagree with that. I follow a principle that is a principle used by traditional systems engineering and borrow from buildings architecture. This is the principle stated by the architect Louis Sullivan. He's an architect of the 19th century. This principle is form follows function. The design of the building is based on the functionality of the building. So the functional architecture is very important for 
identify performance requirements. We have the functions and we identify the performance of each function. And we can allocate the function or we can allocate the function plus the performance requirement. There are two approaches here. I some people that prefer allocate functions and these people that prefer to allocate functional requirement mass plus performance requirement. Functional architecture is very important so for safety analysis. Functional architecture is the core model for mechatronic systems. So the functionality is independent of the implementation. The implementation of the function as a mechanical component, an electronical component, or either a software component. For mechatronic systems, the functional architecture is the core artifact that integrates the diverse engineering specialities. Here is how we develop more specifically the functional architecture. We develop the hierarchy. In the hierarchy, we identify a group of related functions and we apply the n square chart. From the n square chart, we identify the functional flows because in the n square chart, we identify dependencies in the between functions. For example, a function sends an output that is used as an input by the next function. This sequence is identified in the n square chart. The functional hierarchy is very important because we have the functional coverage of the system functionality in the functional architecture, and mainly in the functional hierarchy. We apply the, principia, the principles of functional cohesion and, sequen and sequential cohesion, very important principles to build the functional architecture. And it's very important to have a consistency between, between this functional hierarchy, functional architecture and the physical architecture. Alfonso, will illustrate it in the sample. As I mentioned before, for us, it's very important, uh, and we implement it in Cameo, to use the n square chart. In the n square chart, we have the functions in the diagonal. In the row above, in this row, we have the inputs external to this group of functions. And the, in this column, we've, we have the outputs external to the group of functions. And we use here the input in columns um, convention. So function M set, set, says the, sends this output that is an input to function B. The n square chart is very, very useful. It's similar uh, to another artifact that is called the design structure matrix that is very used by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and the Technical University of Munich. So we have functionality and we use the functionality, the functional hierarchies and the functional um, n square charts to build the functional flows. And the functional flows are built using uh, sysml activity diagrams. In some case, for example, in the activity grammars, I re we recommend, this is an heuristic. In some case, where you would like to avoid uh, undeterministic behavior, we recommend in the activity diagrams to use in interruptible, in interruptible regions. I recommend you to, to know more about that, to look at chapter nine of the book, of the book of the methodology. What, I will hand over Alfonso to the second part of this webinar. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I will share my screen and continue from there. So, can you guys see my screen right now? Yes, we do. So, great. So, uh, as we have seen the, the, the overview of the methodology, now we can jump into how to define the functional architecture of this electric parking brake system. And as Jose said, um, we are going to do it in three steps. First, we are going to create a functional hierarchy, that functional tree, and then we are going to define the functional interfaces from the functions that are identified from the tree and use these two artifacts you know, to, to create this functional flow, you know, to represent this functional flow, that uh, this compendium of the structure plus behavior 
create the, the functional architecture. But first and foremost, we need to understand the problem. No? And as we were no experts in electric parking brakes, we took a deep dive into the internet no? to look for what is, what is the domain, no? what is the language uh, when people are creating this type of system, no? what are the concepts, the mission, the site functionalities, uh, what possible designs there are there, no? what are the important aspects like safety and the like. No? And based on that, we started to, to, to define the problem. And we start with the mission dimension, remember from the, from the previous slides. And in the mission dimension, the first thing that we should create is the system context. So where is our system uh, talking to which external entities no? to deliver its value? Because remember, the, the functionality in the end is a disemergence of, of behavior no? that, that uh, is obtained when the, the system uh, uh, operates in its environment. So based on that, we can start to define the operational scenarios, no? the, the, define how our system is going to interact with its uh, external entity no? to, the, to the deliver its functionality. No? So you can, we can do it in a text-based way, like uh, write down uh, what are the, the actions and reactions of our system, or we can go for a diagram-based scenario no? to, to, to define the scenarios you see in Activity diagrams. The advantage of that, even if it's more complicated, um, it's more complex to do it in the right way, uh, is that we can easily identify what are the external changes no, at a glance. So once we have clear a set of good um, operational scenarios, we can start extract those needs as Jose Luis was talking about before, no? but from the perspective of the of the user, what does he need? No? For example, that the driver can easily uh, uh, engage the brake now to retain the vehicle after after parking within a determined time, or that the driver can leave the vehicle even if he didn't remember no, that uh, he engaged or not, or that the, 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 the car is secure in place, because in the end, the, the, the system is going to recognize that hazardous situation and automatically engage. No? So once we have a set of uh, needs, we can cluster them to create this high level artifact you know, that is the capabilities, is this ability of the system to perform a determined effect. You know, that is really important and simply understood by the customer. And, uh, and so that uh, he wants from the, from the system, comfortable control, you know, easy to, to use, like uh, picking a button or something like that. You know? Or that, uh, that the, the, the system increases the, the safety, you know? identifies hazardous situation and engages or retain the vehicle and doesn't allow us to uh, to get hurt, no? but that uh, it adjusts it itself no? they, when the, the environment changes, you know, like the brake pipe are work out, or that the temperature changes, for example, no? that uh, he needs to increase the, the retaining force for that. So while we have that, we can jump into the, the system dimension. No? But I, I put this um, slide here to, to tell you that as we are using a, a modeling tool, and these, all these elements are connected together, you know, that you can easily control the evolution of your of your model artifacts. You know, like you can see easily what are what the capabilities are important to you to the first, no, because uh, the first one is uh, involving in more operational scenario, you know, and they are related through the needs. You know? So you can you can do this kind of table and matrices that are quite useful. So. Now that um, we have the, the mission dimension clear, so we understand the problem, then let's gonna refine the problem and build this a bit, a functional architecture out of that. So as we said before, there are three steps, the functional hierarchy in the first place, this functional tree that describes the top level functions and how uh, through analysis are decomposed into simpler functions that in the end can be allocated to system components. No? Then, once we have that, we jump into the definition of the functional interfaces. You know, what are the, the dependency between those identified functions from the tree? And with these two artifacts, as we said before, we can, in a semi-automatic way, using Camille, the, uh, the functional flows you know, that describe the, the behavior of the system in the end. So, if we go to, to the definition of the functional hierarchy, it's, it's true. As Jose Luis said before also, that the one of the key, uh, and I need to repeat that, one of the key uh, concepts is that the function for us is a transformation. And it's a transformation of input items into output items. And these items should be matter and your data. 
for example, what is the function function of a motor? No? It's to produce torque, but it doesn't produce torque because of nothing. No, it 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 does a convert it converts the electrical energy into this rotating mechanical effort. No? Or a car, what does a car do? No? It transports its passengers and the driver, the, the input from their initial position to their destination, not the, the same input at the output, but the state change. So uh, once we have that clear, uh, is there any help there to, to allow us to identify in an easier way this kind of transformation? And the answer is yes, you can look for templates in the literature, like this one from Hadley and Pirbey, that uh, it is for real-time systems, no? and they classify functions as user interface process control input output processing. No, I don't, I don't know. Sorry is to there... disturb. Um, your the sound yes. isn't perfect. Can you can, could you just adjust your micro a little bit? It's really not perfect. Uh, it, uh, Maybe you get a little more distance um, or closer. I don't know, but it's a little bit. There's something uh, like no, a this cancellation. Uh, I guess. I, I, yeah. Yeah. Try um, it. I, Connected. I'm gonna try to change uh, the speaker. Yeah, well, the a, we, we yeah. would we would with a lot we would love to have a little bit more volume. So to put it like this, okay, thank you. Okay, can, can you hear me now, better? It's, it's better now. Yes, thanks. Now. Yes, thanks. Okay, cool. So uh, we said we can use templates, or we can go for uh, looking for taxonomies, no? Like this one from NIST. That is really good for uh, for um, uh, industrial processes, and not only define the not only classify functions or transformations and, uh, and different types, but also the the possible inputs and outputs that you can receive. You know? So, based on this, we can start to produce the, uh, the tree, and we are going to do it in two approaches. The first one is the, using this top-down approach, where we are going to start from the capabilities and that we define in the mention dimension, and also from the top-level requirements that. Of course, I just talk about it, but we are not uh, showing that in the in, in this example. No? And then we need to analyze this uh, top level function and the composing uh, part no? until we reach a level, as we said before, to uh, that we can we can identify elements of form no? the system components. So um, we also gonna do the other way around no? to look for this um, bottom-up approach where we start from another artifact of the mission dimension, that is uh, the rational scenarios, and look for low-level function for here. No? And and you will need to cluster them together for those that are highly rated, and then you can compose up the tree until you reach the, the, the highest level functions. So another concept to keep in mind is this um, consistency between input outputs. Uh, between uh, several layers of ab abstractions. So, for example, if a function receives uh, transform determined input into a determined output, its children shall do the same. So, it might be that this uh, input here is a complex one and you can divide it, it up, split it up so that function to one receive part of the input and function to two receive. A part of the uh, from the input no? to do the transformation, but in the end the composition shall be the same. And this is one of the key concepts, together with the, this concept of function as a transformation. No? So when do we consider that we are finished? Is when we can demonstrate that the, those identified functions from the tree can realize all the needed capabilities. Remember that uh, top-down approach that we can cover all the operational scenario. Remember this bottom-up approach that we can transform, and this is key. All the inputs from the uh, from the context, these external inputs into external outputs, and then can be um, that we can identify elements of forms you know, that can have this responsibility for performing the transformation on the lever side of the of the, of the tree. You know? And we recommend it that uh, we do it a one to one allocation so that you don't share the responsibility of performing a determined function between two components if it is not clear. Uh, a clear analysis of what part of that transformation needs to be um, allocated to, to component one and which part to component two. No? So you should divide this uh, function in, into two. Okay, and here is the how the tree looks like for the electric parking brake. You know? So you can you can see here for the for the for this topic for the immobile uh, vehicle, the recall, 
you can easily go to the to the first layer you can understand that uh, this function here receive the inputs from the from the stem up they do some transformation and decisions until this one is producing the required returning force that avoids the vehicle to go away to go away no? and these ones are providing some information to the vehicle network and this one is gonna um, uh, provide the indication whether the, the parking brake is active or not or is returning the vehicle or not to the driver. So now that we have defined um, uh, the functional tree, we can jump into the definition of the functional interfaces using this famous n squared uh, matrix of charge. So for doing that, the first thing that we need to do is to identify what type of function, what functions in the tree are going to go there, no? uh, that are important for us also to describe the behavior in the end no? of the system. So we, our recommendation is not to stop on the higher level but to mix the first and the second level at least so that the we can verify using the square chart that these uh, second layer functions are really highly related between them to you know to come uh, uh, to to comprise the parent no? to compose the parent so how do we create in cameo this n square chart what we are going to do is to create an activity diagram where we are going to push those identified functions into here and then we are going to create a dependency matrix that is observing this activity diagram okay so every time we push a new function here and it's represented as an action it's going to also be uh, updated here no and there goes a column not only that but when we create a um an input or an output it's also going to be shown here as a as a, as a row the output and the input in here no so uh, the next step would be to create those those input pin output pins that uh, meet the, each of the functions and if you type them you will also at the same time create these uh, the initial steps for the data dictionary no? which is a really good thing so um so once we have um, uh, updated it, uh, the diagram with the input outputs and also the external inputs and external outputs that are needed we can start to connect them in the in the in the matrix uh, by optic flows. No? So then you will you will um, uh, get something like that. But we do not stop here. No, so now we are focused totally in the functional uh, on the n squared matrix, and we need to sequence the n squared matrix. Uh, what what that, does it mean? No? So in the end, is that we show through the interactions on the upper uh, triangular matrix we need to reorder all the all the functions so that the diagonal shows the sequence of transformation from the external inputs that goes into the first uh, functions in the diagonal and then the sequence of transformation are cascading until the lower part of the matrix produces the needed external outputs huh? so how do we do that is uh, you can follow the rules by, given by this uh, by this link that is applied for the design system matrix and uh, it because in the end it's more of the same I say, no? and this um, kind of matrix um, allow us to check whether our identification of the functions uh, was the right one no? because in the end we would have uh, after sequencing the matrix we have many uh, dependencies on the upper side that uh, follow the cascading, that is okay, but we also have many uh, dependencies here as feedbacks. That means that the, the whole set is totally coupled and there is no way of, uh, the, 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 you should revise back the identification of function to simplify those dependencies. You know? So do, do you need to go back and, and, and think about whether you did you uh, identify the right transformation. And if if it is empty, empty, the same thing. No? That uh, you have no dependency between functions and they are not even coupled. So the good thing is that you have some kind of dependency in the upper side, and the, the feedbacks are the closest to the diagonal, diagonal as possible, no? because that way you can identify seeds for your modular architecture, or or also consider that these two were. Uh, uh, what are part of a new parent function or the higher level 
And if we go for the example, we can see here, after sequencing the, the, the matrix, that uh, the, the first, as we said before, no, the first uh, uh, functions in the diagonal are the ones absorbing, receiving all the external inputs, no? and then they are producing some output to the, to the next function in the diagonal until the uh, functions on the lower side, like produce vacuum force, produce the needle uh, retaining force, and uh, these ones are producing the, the status of, of the network, network, uh, network and, uh, and the indication for the driver. You know? And as we not stop on the first layer, but we also use the second layer, we, have, we can verify here, as we said, that the parent uh, was the right one, no? because these three functions are highly related highly dependent on uh, perform the uh, related transformations. Okay, now um, that we have um, uh, that, we are gonna use that uh, information created in the model to create these functional flows in, in a semi-automatic way. No? So the only thing that we need to do is to focus back in the activity diagram and just select everything and display the paths that we were creating using the, the N squared chart. No? So then you click on reorder automatically and you will get an activity like that. No? But what is happening here is that uh, if you try to simulate or if you really understand the, the activity diagram, how do they behave, you will see that uh, it doesn't describe the behavior that you would like. No? So you need to add these control flows and nodes to to, uh, to make the, the diagram to behave as you would expect. No? And, uh, and I highly recommend that you do it using uh, in every step when you add a, a control flow or control node that you simulate it no? until you get the right behavior out of that. No? So you need to decide whether you need, uh, you will have parallel threads or when the time in transformation should be activated no? based on on the timing decision that you need to, to take. Okay, and here you can see the, how the um, how the behavior, the, the functional flow, um, it is shown for the electric parking brake. No, and as we said before, the this look like at the end square chart. No, that uh, these functions here are the, those ones that are uh, receiving the extra inputs, and then it's the cascading in there. No, until the, the external outputs from the contest are produced. No. Um, so every time you add uh, the control flows, so you will see whether you are closer, a step closer to the real behavior that you want to describe. And now we are in a in a good position to 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 identify uh, uh, physical entities. No, for the physical architecture, you, you could you could say, okay, in order to capture the drive manual action, I want to have a switch. No, or I want to have a switch. With um, a, with a telltale you know, that indicates the packing status to the to the to the, to the driver, you know? and, and for producing braking force, I want to have this integrated caliper you know, that produces the the needed braking force based on the uh, braking control signal. You know? Or to measure inclination, I want to have a tilt angle sensor, you know? or it might be that you need an accelerate, uh, accelerator sensor, you know? and then you should refine this measure inclination uh, more to say, that, okay, I want to sense the, um, uh, the acceleration and the computing of the inclination based on the acceleration is gonna be done by the ECU. Okay. So as a summary, we have seen an overview of the uh, IC PBOA methodology and what are the important aspects of that. We have seen uh, how to apply the methodology using Cameo to create um, functional architectures, no? and with this, this example, the electric packing brake system. And we can say that this is a seamless way to create functional architecture that are easily understood, if we have the time here, <laughs> that uh, are validated by simulation and that uh, are consistent with the, with the requirements and the mission dimension. No? That, uh, and you have seen that uh, creating the structure by this hierarchy plus the dependencies, you can easily derive in a semi automatic way the, the functional flow, you know, the behavior, the functional behavior of the system. If you want to know more about the, uh, the, the methodology, you can take a look on, on the book on practical model based systems engineering that 
were written by by Jose Luis and Carlos Hernandez, where the the um, the methodology is detailed, explained with practical examples. And if you want even more, there are uh, some papers published in this website that they were published in, in, in other uh, conferences. Also, uh, dealing with some aspect of the methodology with applied examples for that. No? Thank you very much for, for attending the meeting. And um, uh, we are looking forward to answering any comment or question that you have. Thank you. Thanks, Alonso, for Thanks, Alonso. giving us an inside view in this quite complex, complex topic about functional architecture.